Hey guys, uh, it's Mr. Garner. Just wanted to go through real quickly and give you a quick run through on our notes concerning correlational research. Okay, so basically from where we are right now in our unit, we've already talked, uh, as you know, on the right hand side about descriptive stat. We talked about descriptive research. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take some of our findings from our descriptive research, whether it's a case study, a survey or an observation. And we're going to see if we can find some a strong relationship between variables. And if we find something there, then we're going to go ahead and take the next step towards experimental. Okay, so right now we're kind of right in the middle. So our focus today is going to really be around what correlational research is. Okay, how do we figure out what an operational definition is? How do we randomly sample? What's a correlational coefficient? And how do we interpret scatter plots? Okay, and I think within that there's going to be some other terms we're going to look at as well. Okay, um, so what I want to focus on today first off is really the meaning of what correlational research is. And I have this, you know, highlighted, emboldened, um, we talk about the relation the word relation and correlation, okay? The purpose is of this is we want to find a relationship, and that's the key word, rela relationship uh, between two variables. If we know how they're related, we can predict outcomes, okay? So you think about certain variables like drug use, gender, sleep deprivation, depression. We could probably find maybe some sort of a relationship between some of those different factors, okay? Um, if we find a relationship, maybe we have an idea of maybe predicting some possible outcomes. But the problem is it's not going to tell us why. It's not going to say what actually causes because correlation is not causation. Please tattoo that on your arms right now with a pencil or sorry, a pen or a marker because you'll need to know this for the rest of the year. Um, just because we find a correlation or relationship between variables, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that way all the time, right? Does it mean that, you know, high schoolers are the worst drivers? Not necessarily, okay? Um, when we look at like drug use and gender, uh, age group and gen age group and uh, drug use, um, we know that certain ages are more at risk for drug use, but does everybody at that age group use drugs? No, they don't, okay? So it's not causation. All right, so what we're going to really focus on today, um, as we've said, is we've already kind of looked at this left-hand side of the chart. We found our hypothesis. Now we're going to go ahead and create an operational definition and try to find some sort of a relationship. Okay, so we know that obviously doing this, it's a technique that's used to try to find a relationship between variables. We use it to make predictions, okay, such as the relation between SAT scores and success at college. We know obviously that's not the case all the time, right? Um, I know my own self. I was not a great test taker. My SATs, I couldn't really break a thousand, but I did fine in college. Um, so in many ways, we have to use the SAT as a necessary evil to try to basically, you know, sort people into groups and kind of stagger them. But we know in all cases, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the true end all be all of how you're going to do in college. Um, and that's why we say, once again, correlation is not causation. We want to try to ask ourselves, do these relationships uh, between variables, do they vary together? All right. So in experimental, we like to manipulate one variable to see if it has an effect on the other. We hold everything else constant. Here, we can't really do that. So we look to try to find a relationship between the two. And the most way, common way we do this is by you obviously giving a survey. Okay. So one of the things we wanted to make sure we were clear with, and we're going to do this today in class, or we did it in class with the list of the different um, topics, we want to try to find some sort of relationship between them. All right. Um, so we're going to start with two dependent variables. It could be height, weight, golf score, numbers of years the person's played golf, IQ scores, size of your big toe, salary, happiness. There are two things we might think are related. And we might have done this based upon our descriptive research. Now we want to go ahead and we want to think, is there a relationship between them? Okay. Um, are the numbers which represent height somehow related to weight? Okay. We kind of ask ourselves those questions. Once we go ahead and once we figure out if there could be a relationship, then we know we have to find our operational definition. This is your exact description of how you're going to measure what you're talking about, how you're going to measure your, depend, your, your two variables you're looking at. You have to do this so that way it can be replicated, okay, and you at least know what and how you are measuring it, okay. If you don't do this, you're setting yourself up for failure because you're going to have biases and inconsistencies in what you're measuring and what you're researching. Okay, so we have to be exact. So some examples here on the next one, as you'll see when we do our sample correlations, um, look at how precise we get with our different dependent variables, right? We have height in inches without shoes. We have weight in pounds without clothes, okay? But as you see down here, whether it's for IQ scores, we use a common test. Um, the size of your big toe, right, in a certain unit of measurement from where to where. Salary, okay? How, how do we describe happiness, okay? So you have to kind of sometimes think what you're going to measure, and you can think about this in your unit project. It has to be something that's quantifiable, that's measurable. If it's not, 
you're setting yourself up for failure with, with bias and with, uh, with confounding variables. Okay, so at this time in class, we know we did our sample worksheet. We went around, we did our quick little survey. You looked at like 40 different relations. You did a quick little Google form. You filled it out. And then we went through and we started to do our relationship. We surveyed our peers. And now we're going to go ahead and try to collect our data. Okay, so now once we've gotten our data, um, and like I said, the fun thing that you saw with that is by going ahead and surveying your peers or whatever else, um, it's going to allow us to, uh, to go ahead and kind of get some crude data. Okay. And quickly and efficiently, we can use Google, we can use a form to go ahead and sort our data. But in correlational research, each participant in the research is measured on two different dependent variables. Okay. Are they, are these measurements unrelated to each other and are they somehow related? That's the question we want to go ahead and ask ourselves. Okay. And we do this, but obviously when we ask our friends or ask people in our school that we're going to look at or our sample size, we have to make sure that it's random. Okay. So this can be called random sampling or random selection. Okay. Random sampling and random selection mean the same thing. Okay. Each participant has an equal chance of participating in the study. You select your participants of the population to go ahead and take the take the survey or take the study. Okay. Um, getting an alphabetical list and picking every 10th name. If you're randomly sampled, you can generalize your findings to the population. And by doing that, um, you then can go ahead and say, hey, look, we have a random sample. We've representatively sampled everyone, people from different demographics, different age groups, different, we've controlled for those things. You then can go ahead and generalize them. Okay. Um, if it's not equal in chance, it is biased. And that's what you have to understand. So we're not going to ask that you go ahead and obviously, you know, it's impossible to do that for this little unit project, but you want to make sure that you address your unit project saying, hey, you know, if we were to do this for real, here's how I would go ahead and set it up so that I'm not biased. Okay. Some may choose not to participate, right? Non-response bias. We have to make sure we control for that. Okay. But like you said, a representative sample is very important. Okay. Um, to make sure that it represents the entire population that we are, that we are looking at. So you have to do your homework. All right. So once we've now collected our data and we have a good sample size, now we can go ahead and calculate and try to find the strength of the correlation. Okay. And that's the key word here. We use scatter plots. Okay. A scatter plot is a graph that's comprised of points generated by the values of the two variables. Okay. Typically our X is our first variable or Y is our second. The X is the independent, Y is the dependent. The slope of the points depicts the direction and the amount of scatter shows the strength of our relationship. And that's the key thing. The amount of scatter and the correlational value, the R value, is what depicts the strength of the relationship. Don't get so hung up on if it's positive or negative. Focus on what it, what it tells us about the relationship. Okay, So this right here would be a perfect positive. Typically, you don't have this. But if it goes straight up and to the right, and if you think about the number lines on the X and Y axis, as X goes up, Y goes up, it's perfectly positive. They both increase at the same rate. Okay, Here on the left shows a negative relationship. right? So as X goes up, y goes down and it's a perfect negative correlation typically you don't see this on the right hand side you see no relationship right you really don't have any sort of trend line that you see and like i said by just looking at the spray of the the, uh, the points you can probably figure out there's not a strong relationship all right so how we calculate this it's a tricky thing we're not going to ask you to calculate it you could do it in excel but for us right here you will always be given an r value and then you're going to be asked to go ahead and calculate it so one trader behavior varies with the other we say that they correlate, okay? The positive or negative indicates the strength of the relationship. Or sorry, the, the number indicates the strength of the relationship. So that would mean that if you are somewhere between, and I think we have this, this sheet right here is a great one to see. If you kind of see at the bottom part on that, on that chart, anything that's from about 0 to 0 0.2 or 0.3 is a very weak to no correlation at all. 0.3 to 0.7 is moderate, and then 0.7 to 1 is strong. And as you look over there on the right-hand side, you can see from top to bottom, how stronger the correlations get. Okay. Now, in the previous slides, I was saying before the positive or the, the the positive or negative indicates the direction of the relationship. So, it's positive; it goes up and to the right. If it's negative, it goes down and to the right. Okay. So, think back to what we saw right here. Okay. So, this is your perfect negative on the left. This is your perfect positive on that screen. Okay. So, the positive negative indicates the direction, but then the number, the decimal point, indicates the strength of the relationship. Remember, as I said before, the number cannot go above one. The number cannot go below negative one. So if your number goes to negative one or positive one, it's, it's, it's a correct number. If it's 1.01 or negative 2.2, it is impossible. So always mark them off as a, you know, impossible choice on your test. 
All right, so now I'm going to ask you to go ahead and try yours. I give you some directions back on the worksheet to figure it out, how to go ahead and calculate this in Excel. Um, it is doable, okay? Um, so I'll give you a second to try that out. All right, so now we're back here. And now that we're back here, we're going to walk ourselves through some of these different correlations, okay? So these are a couple sample correlations I pulled up. Um, but when you see this right here, you'll see that for, for this example, the UVA School of Engineering, right? You have your SAT and you have your first year GPA. The two we think are correlated. And when you see your correlation, if we were to just go ahead and look at this, we would see that there is a pretty solid correlation between SAT score and first year GPA. Most of your points are clustered along that line and you see the line tends to follow a trajectory that's up and to the right, okay? Um, pretty good relationship. But this one here is much better. Notice your strong relationship you see up and to the right, where spring semester GPA versus fall semester GPA, right? Uh, as your fall semester GPA goes up, your spring semester GPA tends to go up. We know that there's outliers. Maybe they're seniors, okay? So if it's not just IQ, then what, okay? So we know that when we think about, like, for these two variables, these aren't so related. Ninth grade data and GPA as a function of IQ, your relationship is 0.49. So... If it's not just IQ, then what are some other factors? And that's what we have to talk about bias, and we have to talk about maybe some of these other points today, and we talk about uh, common response variables, okay? So when we talk about, for example, these guys right here, when we talked before about correlation is not causation, what this essentially means is that when we do correlational research, we could maybe get a relationship that says low self-esteem could cause depression, or could it be depression could cause low self-esteem? It could go either way. It's like that old joke, or the, not say the old joke, but the old saying, like, do violent video games make kids behave bad, or is it the behavior has them go ahead and play the violent video games, okay? So it could go either way. It doesn't tell us why, and it doesn't tell us the causes, okay? We also know that distressing events or predisposition could cause low self-esteem and could cause depression, or it could cause depression. So this is why when we do correlational research, it gives us a direction. It gives us an idea of maybe where we could take our experimental research, but it doesn't tell us what causes it. So we can't rush forward and say every person that has low self-esteem is depressed, or every person that has depression has low self-esteem. It's just not the case, right? Mental illness doesn't cause smoking, or could smoking be a sign of mental illness? It doesn't tell why. It doesn't tell us what the causes are. OK, it's cause it's not causation. It only predicts. Right. So think about some of these. It's kind of funny, but children with big feet reason better than kids with small feet. Is it really? Well, no, it's age. Right. OK, because kids who are older have bigger feet. It sounds silly, but you get the idea. Most predictive factor use of birth control in South Korea was the number of appliances in the home. OK, well, does that really show a relationship? Well, no, because electrical appliances probably mean a different socioeconomic level and those they're probably better educated. Okay. Frosted flakes and cancer. Okay. You see this, um, not so much the case because cancer disease of later in life, those who ate frosted flakes are younger. Frosted flakes doesn't cause cancer. Get the idea. Okay. Um, same thing here with diet soda and weight gain. Okay. So many times what you just saw right here, when we find a relationship that's other than causal. So when we talk about experimental, we try to isolate them. Correlational research, we might have a relationship between uh, more than two variables. And when that happens, we have to make sure that we look and try to address that. Okay, there could be something else that's causing the outcome. You don't know this because you didn't control for those variables. Okay, so you can try out some of these. I'll just pull them up. But, you know, when you think about, for example, like time of the year, okay, um, age, for example. So some of the relate, some of the examples you guys just saw are what we like to call common response variables, okay? Well, when you look at a common response variable, X and Y are affected by something else, okay? Many times I like to call this the third variable, um, or in some cases like the, the missing variable, confounding variable, for example. Um, but then we also have confounding variables, where in some cases something else, A, could affect X, and B could affect Y. When we get to experimental research, we're going to really hit home on this, this idea that, you know, there could be outside variables going on, like maybe sleep, uh, method of studying, for example, um, time or things maybe you didn't control for that intelligence, for example, that could affect maybe your independent and dependent variables. So confounding variables are very much uh, a, a reality of this. We, we can't control for them, so we have to be aware of what they could possibly be. Okay. All right. So with that, I will leave you in peace. Um, like I said, for example, for, for this, hopefully you really understand today a couple of the basic things. Correlation is not causation. 
Okay. Um, we, we, it doesn't tell why it doesn't tell, uh, any, you know, causes for anything. We have to take that with experimental research, but we have to make sure we're clear with our trend lines our R values, how we can interpret a scatter plot. Um, and you know, we do the best we can to try to operationally define things so that they